Hey guys, Tyler here, and this is the Garage Warrior Podcast, and I'm super excited today to have with me Ryan. Ryan, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. How do you pronounce the last name? It's pronounced Fanley. It's like Stanley with an F. Fanley. Okay, all right. It's Ryan Fanley on the call. Ryan is a Poliquin trained coach, which means he knows a lot of information. But before we dig into all this stuff, uh, Ryan, what's your background like? If people don't know who you are, what is it that you do, and what is it you're trying to teach people? Well, currently, um, I'm a course conductor for Charles Poliquin. So I work, uh, I travel internationally lecturing on fat loss, hypertrophy, uh, athletic performance, training athletes, all different sure. facets of physical performance. Prior to that, uh, I spent six years in the U.S. Air Force, um, and then I was a Division One NCAA strength and conditioning coach at Miami University for six years. So I've got kind of a mixed background. I worked some uh, with military operatives on, on their conditioning and fitness levels. Uh, I've worked with Division One athletes, and I've also spent some time working with general population. And then currently, I kind of uh, train the trainers, I guess, or coach the coaches um, who attend our seminars. So. Well, you know, Ryan, you see, one of the things that I really am interested in is the guys who are actually in the grind, in the nuts and bolts, getting the results, really helping people out, because, you know, there's a lot of... Um, armchair theoreticians, like the pseudo <laughs> bro science people out there. You know what I mean, Absolutely. right? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, the fact that you've spent so much time educating yourself and learning more about this stuff and everybody else is like just making claims? Uh, you know what? I don't let it bother me. Sure. Um, I think anything that gets my blood pressure up, I just let it, I let it go. There's no sense in me getting upset over the actions of others. But what I always try to do is I just make sure that the information that I put out and the lectures that I give are based on both research and in the trenches. Sure. I think one of the issues today, you've got kind of, uh, you got two ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you've got the meatheads who have spent their lives in the gym but can barely read. Right. And, and, and they have great results, great physiques, they perform well, they're athletic. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the research nerds who... They know, you know, they know their topics, they've done the research, they've read every book, but they don't look like they've ever been in a gym in their life. And I try to think of myself as kind of a blend of those two people. So sure. I've read so many books on training. I mean, everything from the early, uh, early 1900s, late 1800s through now, I've got massive bookcases. I stay on top of scientific journals, but I've also spent time coaching real athletes, real people, training myself, training others. So I, you know, I like to... I think it's good to draw from both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I'd love to spend some time talking about kind of the number, like the top fallacies of the fitness industry, because so many people are being led so many different directions by the media, by the men's fitness, by Dr. Oz, all this crazy stuff, right? So, I mean, what do you see like as maybe the top five things that are just going way wrong in the fitness industry? I put, him, oh my I put him on the have spot. To narrow, <laughs> have to narrow it to five? Uh, yeah, right. So just, just off the top of your head, rattle on them. Maybe we'll go back and forth and kind of talk about each one. Okay. Uh, first one, uh, and I'm going to be thinking out loud here, but one of the big ones uh, is a nutritional myth that fat is bad for you. Oh, uh, um, even saturated fat, okay? So <laughs> people will say, you know, they'll see me pounding a 16-ounce uh, ribeye and say, aren't you worried about your cholesterol? Aren't you worried about your fat? And I'll say, nope, absolutely not. And here's where the myth started. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, what happened was scientists were noticing an increase in heart disease. So they tried to do research on what caused heart disease. And they found that people that had high intakes of saturated fat had higher levels of heart disease. So in their minds, it was a simple, all right, fat causes heart disease. The problem is, at that point in time, they did not distinguish between the saturated fat coming from good quality animal protein and the saturated fat that's found in a Twinkie that's highly processed, uh, trans fats, things like that. So they didn't separate saturated fats from trans fats. So what we have now is a culture of people that think that even fat from animal proteins is a significant risk for heart disease. And it's, it's the fact is it's not. And so when you avoid fats long term, uh, you basically signal your body to hold on to body fat, okay? So people think they're doing the right things to get leaner and in better shape and more healthy, but in reality, they're making themselves fatter. I mean, I don't know how many people I've seen, family and friends, neighbors, who, you know, they, they 
keep wanting to tell me how they're doing the right things because they eat low fat <laughs> chips and low fat this and that, and their waistline seem to be ever expanding. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's so funny, Ryan. Like, I, even even myself, who's been in the industry for over a decade now, is like finding myself from time to time being like, "Oh, should I not eat that?" Is it what? Well, I know the difference. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so ingrained in our society that everybody, like you said, thinks that fat is bad. What do you, what do you recommend for fat for people? Like what's your kind of take on the whole thing for healthy fats and intake? Basically healthy fats. I think any source of quality animal protein, when I say quality, I'm talking organic grass fed beef, not the, uh, uh, growth hormone pumped antibiotic pump sure. beef I'm talking naturally raised. So any, any animal products are going to have a good amount of healthy fats for you. I also think things like coconut oil, uh, organic coconut oil, organic olive oil, um, and even organic butter are good sources of healthy sure. fat. We also have uh, the nut and seed family, so you know, organic almonds, cashews, Brazil nuts. Those are all good quality sources of fat. So in a basic way, you know, uh, having having good quality cuts of meat, and then having vegetables that are cooked in either coconut oil, olive oil, or organic butter. Uh, with a handful of nuts, and that's kind of the optimal optimal meal um, to to keep you healthy. It's going to be just enough fat uh, to keep your cells running efficiently without having too much of an excess uh, calorie consumption. If that Abs- makes sense. Absolutely. So you so with most people, do you do you give them a gram amount, or do you just kind of say add it to your vegetables? And you yeah, know. I don't. I just, I just basically tell people to you know cook their food in it, drizzle it over their vegetables. I mean, I don't know anyone who's going to cook a cup of broccoli with 20 tablespoons of butter. You're just going to use a little bit. Obviously, obviously there's some fat guy out there that's probably going to try to cook it in 20 tablespoons of butter. Right, right. You know what? At the end of the day, the, the, the hormone signaling that takes place by eating good quality fats far outweighs the high caloric value of fat. Sure. That's a great way to put it, man. That's fantastic. And I, I think that's something that's so powerful. Well, what's, what's another, uh, What's another potential myth that we could debunk on this podcast in the fitness Oh, aspect? another myth. Okay, another big myth for me is that uh, going out for a long, steady jog is mm. the best way to get lean. Like, Man, you just picked the two best ones from the start. That's good stuff. <laughs> Let's dig into that because, you know what, I, I see the same thing, man. I, I Sometimes when I like the same thing, I also say, I'm going to lean up. And I say, I'll start running. Uh, what am I doing? Why am I trying to, you know, I'll go do yeah, some sprints, well, right? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Okay, so here's here's the thing. Again, it goes back to old school science. So early on when they were trying to figure out how the body used energy for fuel, they did these various lab tests. And what they found was that steady state aerobic work or going for a long jog uh, per- burned a higher percentage of fat for fuel during exercise than activities like sprinting and weight training. Sprinting and weight training primarily use carbohydrates for fuel or stored muscle glycogen. So when that research came out, everyone jumped on the bandwagon and said, well, clearly aerobic exercise is the best for fat loss. There's a couple problems with that theory, however. The first problem with the theory is that it only accounts for the calories burned during exercise. Okay, And with aerobic exercise, steady state, it's pretty much you, you only get the benefit of the during exercise period. So if you run for 30 minutes, yes, you burn fat for 30 minutes, but once that's over, your fat burning slows down. Nothing. With sprinting, with weight training, and anaerobic type activities, you may not burn a ton of fat for fuel during exercise, but your metabolism can stay elevated for up to 72 hours. So that means that if I do a workout now, a sprint workout, hard and fast, only take 10 or 15 minutes, Three days from now, I will still be burning fat at a higher rate than had I not done the workout. So that's in terms of efficiency. The next thing deals with exercise efficiency. And here's where a lot of people screw up. Okay, Aerobic training is in, is much like increasing the fuel efficiency of a car, right? So people start out, you do a two-mile run, and it burns X number of calories of fat. Well, over time, as you train, the body adapts, and the adaptation is that you become more fuel efficient. So what does that mean for a car? Fuel efficient for a car means you get more miles to the gallon, right? Well, (laughs) same thing for body fat. With aerobic work, you get more miles per calorie of fat. So now that two-mile run that used to burn 150 calories, guess what? Now it only burns 100 because you've become more fuel efficient. And so what happens is you're stuck at that point. You either have to run faster 
or run longer, okay, which in the short term is fine. I think, I think aerobic exercise, uh, steady state work is okay for two different populations. First of all, someone who's just starting out in exercise because you'll get results for six to eight weeks with steady state exercise. It builds general work capacity. The next group is that I think it's good for is for maybe an elite bodybuilder who's looking to get as shredded as possible in the final four to four to eight weeks right. prior to competition. And, and it's kind of like an icing on the cake type method. But for most people looking to lose body fat, not only is it not necessary, it can be detrimental, uh, especially in females too. There's actually research in females that too much aerobic work can actually reduce your thyroid output. Well, if you reduce your thyroid output, your whole metabolism slows and you end up being sluggish, tired, cold all the time and, and fatter. Yeah. Well, that, and that doesn't even touch on, you know, looking at the way hormones interact when we're, when we're doing like long, slow distance. And I'd love to touch on that in a second, but what you just mentioned was totally great because people really think it's like the bee's knees. But I was going to talk to you about um, uh, uh, intensity ranges, because for me, what I like to advocate is kind of that, you know, if you were to go off the heart rate, that 60, 55% and lower intensity or that 85% and higher intensity. And I tell my people like, hey, this is the middle ground we want to try to avoid for the most part because it's not going to do you any good in the long run. And part of that's because there's a huge surge of cortisol, which reduces muscle mass. Whereas when you're over that 85% intensity, not only do you burn fat longer, but you're also going to build muscle mass. Is that correct? 